Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Chelsea McCullough. I serve as Executive Director for Texans for Economic Progress. And I'm really thrilled, um, number one, to see so many people here today. You know, when you pair um, unlikely conversations such as real estate and technology, you're never quite sure who's going to show up or if anybody's going to show up. So I'm really happy to see the enthusiastic response. Um, and before I go on introducing our panel members, I also wanted to thank Capital Factory. Uh, they're hosting us here tonight. And while I don't encourage you to freely roam around the buildings, uh, they do do tours. Um, so you can look on their website. They're um, you know, certainly an inspiration for us here in Austin. They serve as a home for technology companies. They're an incubator and work with a lot of accelerators locally um, around the state and around the nation. Um, and they're also a real mecca, you know, for, for folks who come to Austin, uh, both across the country and around the world. So uh, we're really grateful to them for being part of our tech community. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Texans for Economic Progress before I go down the line of our esteemed panel. Um, we are a technology coalition. We're a statewide technology coalition, and essentially what that means is uh, myself and our chairman, Robert Houghton, here in the front, Brave Robert, um, we act as translators. And our job is Robert's mostly in the Capitol. He has amazing relationships with legislative officials, uh, both statewide and nationally. And my job is to sit in the middle of the technology, technology community statewide and listen. And between the two of us, we, to use the analogy again, pair unlikely folks, which is technology executives, entrepreneurs, universities, and elected officials, just to start the conversation, the dialogue around tech policy. So it's just kind of an overview. I'm happy to tell you more, visit our website. Um, of course, all of our um, hashtags and, and Twitter handles up here. Um, so I encourage you to pay attention to um, what we're doing. But enough about me and enough about us. Uh, to my right is Joshua McClure. He is CEO of Real Massive. Real Massive uh, was really kind of the inspiration behind this event. I think it's really interesting um, how technology is basically disrupting very traditional <coughs> industries, whether it's um, transportation or education or real estate. Uh, technology is basically inserting itself into these traditional industries and what used to be hierarchical is now becoming um, very flat and Josh is helping to usher that in. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, of course. And I'll give you an opportunity to kind of go into Real Massive, what you do, what it's all about, all that kind of good stuff. And to his right, Councilman Chris Riley, I'm sure is a familiar face to many of you. Um, been with the city of Austin for some time, an original Austinite, which there are few and far between, I'm sure we all really appreciate it. Um, Backstory, which I think is kind of appropriate, um, Councilman Raleigh and I actually met each other through um, a company that was interested um, in exploring business opportunities in the city of Austin. And Councilman Riley said, you know what, this was, what, five, six years ago, said, um, you know, we've really got to do something about the parking situation downtown. Five or six years ago, it was kind of bearable. Now, um, you know, it's even more challenging. But thank you to your foresight. He was saying, you know, we need an app. We need um, technology to help us communicate among citizens to really understand what options are available. Um, and I think a lot of your work on that is thankful, thankful to you because now we're starting to see some of the results there is of that. App for that. Yeah, there's an app for that. <laughs> exactly. Um, so enough of my quick introductions, I'll let y'all kind of take the stage um, and really just kind of talk about why you are here, here being um, here on this panel and what interests you in terms of technology and real estate. And Josh, I'll start with you. Cool. Well, what really interests me about uh, real estate is, is specifically commercial real estate. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I come from a family of entrepreneurs all the way back to I don't know when. Uh, and uh, and entrepreneurs really um, inspire me. And um, I see it as sort of the lifeblood of our, our, of our country. I was in the Air Force uh, for a while with my co-founder, Craig, who's in the back there. And the reason why I went into the military is really like this um, a desire to see our way of life go forward and be successful. 
and the, the, the beating heart of that is small businesses. And uh, I, was, uh, I was running a software development firm and uh, we were doing well, we had some pretty big contracts and uh, I wanted to find space uh, for the building for my office, just a small, uh, small space. Um, small building, kind of a starter office for um, kind of a, a mid-sized company. And uh, I talked to three tenant reps, all of them fired me. The, the third one was honest enough to tell me that the commission on my 2,000 square feet that I was looking for um, was not worth the hassle of a uh, prospective tenant with a vision for the space, right? And so he didn't want to take me on tour after tour after tour. So you can't find it on the internet and a tenant rep won't help you. You can't find office space. You're kind of like you're sort of screwed unless you've got a relative in the space. And so I saw that as a big opportunity for me and a big opportunity uh, to help other people like me to find space. Then I found out that the big guys out there who are looking for 200,000 square feet are still having. They have the same kind of problems. And so um, that's when I got passionate about it. I, I realized there was a problem. Then I realized there's everybody has this problem, and it's a giant, very intense pain for a lot of people. And I like solving pain, so that's why I'm here. Let's see, am I on here? Can y'all hear me? Not quite. Is that working? Oh, maybe on the bottom. There we go. How about that? Hello? It's coming. There's a magic person behind the. Thanks. Right. Right. Start off on the side panel. Again, I'm Chris Riley, and I serve on the on the Austin City Council. I approach this issue uh, from a number of perspectives, but really to get an understanding of why it means so much to me, I really have to go back to when I first moved downtown. I was born and raised here in Austin, and then moved downtown in 1990, uh, some time ago. Back then, were any of y'all around in downtown Austin in, in 1990, back then? <coughs> there's, there's a few, and so y'all remember what it was like back then. It was a very different place. I always joke about tumbleweeds in the streets. It was, it was, there were some pretty bleak years in there. Um, we did not have a lot of, of uh, shops and services. I, I used to joke about how for a while there, that if you wanted to buy men's clothing downtown, about your only option was forbidden fruit. It was about <laughs> <laughs> six feet, which had some, uh, some uh, possible piece, but I limited, <laughs> and limited, and limited options. Uh, and, and so, um, over, over time, we started to see uh, uh, changes, and really it wasn't just downtown Austin. Downtown Austin was actually a little bit late to the game in, term, in terms of the downtown renaissance. The whole country started seeing a, a, a rebirth of interest in, in downtowns, uh, and, and it was about uh, seeking out more walkable places uh, and, and, and being able to get through your day without getting into a car. And uh, it really was uh, about exercising choices that, that, were, that went beyond what the marketplace was, was offering at that time. And so I, I got uh, very interested in this as I saw the transformation that, that, that we experienced here, here downtown. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why uh, downtown is well suited for that sort of thing because of the, the, the grid we have. But also it, it, is a, it is the kind of situation that actually has a, a fosters uh, a particular atmosphere that includes innovation. It is, it is, a, it is a particularly appealing place. It is a place that, that uh, uh, and it, it provides an urban environment that, that, uh, that potentially is one that one, would, one could uh, seek out, which is, which is extremely important. And, and that gets to the whole, the whole role of tech, the, the, the significant thing that we've seen with tech. If, if we think of one impact that tech has had on, on real estate, that really is about choice. And it has so many different applications even beyond, beyond real estate. But what tech does is it opens us up to, to far more choices than we had before. You know, you're not just stuck with a particular uh, office project, a particular strip mall, a particular place in the suburbs. You have a, a, a choice to make. And that's what Richard, what Richard Florida was talking about when he wrote the whole creative class went back, at the, back in the early part of the, of the downtown renaissance. renaissance. It was about a, a, the young creative class having having a um, having a range of choices before them and being far more selective in, in where they choose choose to live, and that really meant a lot in terms of uh, uh, the, the the role of downtowns in in, uh, in our our lives, because uh, they had just been neglected. But once we had once we had uh, we had. Uh, a universe of workers out there had uh, a freedom of choice to look around and choose at good places. 
they realized that there were significant opportunities here, a huge potential for what we could have here, the things that we could offer. And over time, it was gradual. It occurred in a combination with a combination of, of, of things uh, colliding. But it was in the exercise of choice, people choosing to be here. And once we got that critical mass of people being here, we saw we saw the rebirth of a community. We saw. Uh, a, a, a community reestablished downtown, and for the first time in a long time, we actually saw people on, on we, we could greet neighbors on the streets. We actually had shops that we could go to. It really changed the way that we live um, in, in, in our city uh, for, for many of us downtown. And, and there, are, uh, there are similar examples all over the country where, where it's the urban centers that provided appealing sort of places uh, that, that, that called out to people uh, because of the, the improvements they can make there, that, 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 they, that we're, they're able to achieve in those downtown settings. Obviously, there are improvements um, in, the, in the specific workplaces that we're talking about. Work, the conventional workplaces don't have much appeal. When I worked at a law firm for uh, 17 years, we did not have a, a, a wee room, a massage room, a, 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 a cappuccino bar at the receptionist's desk. It, but once you got into a more competitive environment that was fostered through the, uh, tech and the introduction of tech, where people actually had more choices, they could choose where they want to work. Uh, you, had, you introduced a whole new level of competition, plus you had to foster a certain element of creativity. You, everybody had to up their game. Workplaces had to up their game. Cities had to up their game. We got more serious about our streetscapes. We started paying more attention to the details of urban life. And it was a real turnaround in our city. It's just so, it presents such, such a hopeful and inspiring model for what we can do with our cities, not just downtowns, but really everybody should, has an interest in, in having those options before them. And, and, it's, and, and the role, and tech plays such a critical role in opening up those options, letting people know about what choices are out there. And then having them make intelligent decisions, of, and, and based on the, the competitive environment, where, where we actually have, we have in order to compete, we have to improve the, the, the places where people live and work. And, and it has been hugely significant downtown. Downtown is a far more enjoyable place, and so the potential for, for similar improvements is, is really breathtaking. If you think about opening up. Uh, uh, more livable, walkable environments all across our city and, and all across cities across the country. It really gives you hope for, for uh, uh, the, the future of urban life in our country. And it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it has meant that I've had a very different perspective on, on, on growth than a lot of other folks, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks, uh, it, especially neighborhood folks, uh, change of uh, uh, growth <coughs> means a real threat. It just means traffic and so on. <coughs> but if you get it right, and it's through the help of tech that we've been able to get it right in many situations, it can actually radically improve the quality of life. And that's that's what I'm hoping to build on and to, and to, and to expand to, to other areas across the city. Perfect, and there's so many avenues that I can take off of both of your statements. Um, I wish we had more than just till eight o'clock. But a couple of things, um, you know, when you say choice, what you're really talking about is freedom. And when you're talking about tech, I mean, basically what that means is high-speed internet and these phones, you know, these things which are an extension of myself, which you know now is not even limited to a phone. The phone is kind of antiquated. Now we're talking about wearables and watches and glasses and soon around the corner implants and you know have the pleasure of working with a lot of entrepreneurs out of uh, UT and um, just the stuff that is coming out of that university is awesome and we're right on the edge of things that are going to make it even easier for us to live work and play however however we want and you know one thing that's important to keep in mind and I promise I'm not going to go on and on about tech policy all night but um, you know, as any entrepreneur knows or any elected official knows that this stuff doesn't happen automatically and it doesn't happen by accident. It's lots of planning and the right policies in place to make sure that we have access um, to high-speed internet and to mobile broadband um, and especially the policies in place that make sure that we keep that. You know, it's why that um, one gig is coming to Austin, whether it's going to be delivered by Google, AT&T, Time Warner Cable, the string of other competitors that are going to come. Um, you know, this is what forces real change in our communities. It already has, and it's going to. The next ring of uh, change with one gig is going to be pretty awesome. So I'm excited about that. Um, so let's talk about the reality of that change. And Josh, uh, just 
appreciate you know you looking at something like commercial real estate which is you know from an outsider's perspective with uh, no real estate experience so excuse me on that but um, you know, it seems like there's a real gatekeeper there. And if you get the right gatekeeper, you're in luck. If you don't get the right gatekeeper, then you're not. Um, and it seems that this could usher in a, a lot of fear. Um, I know in other traditional industries, whenever tech has come and kind of disrupted things and turned it all upside down, people get real nervous about it. So I was talking with someone earlier um, just in this session and said, you know, okay, tech's coming in. Um, are you embracing that change? Are you fearing that change? Is this a good thing? Is it not? Um, you know, what's the impact from your perspective? So the, the impact is actually related to the cause. Um, and um, it's gonna sound like this is gonna be a really long-winded answer. I promise you it's not. So it goes back to the dawn of civilization, <laughs> where um, you know somebody had opposable thumbs, right? And they're like, look, I'm able to do this with opposable thumbs. And then they're, oh, you've got opposable thumbs too. You, you know, do it with your thumb. And so it was really, uh, 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 right? And then we've moved on to, we have an established common language that reaches across the globe. And now, uh, and then you take that a step further and people are communicating um, at light speed and you're talking to someone in a, a chat, you're chatting to somebody in Ireland, uh, China, and Paris, Texas at the same time, right? And so the speed of communication is, uh, is going up, 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 up over the course of civilization. And so what we're seeing right now is just this like hockey stick acceleration of we're increasing and accelerating the rate of communication with each other. What that does is it lends transparency to every single process in our lives. Um, there's there's going to be laggard industries and there's going to be early adopter industries. Obviously, uh, the communications world is an early adopter, especially uh, anything that's consumer facing when every consumer has an iPhone, right? Well, um, you get into the enterprise side of real estate and you don't have that stuff. You have Zillow and Trulia on the consumer facing side for residential and on the commercial side, you, you just it's, it's a laggard uh, industry. And so there's, um, if you're an entrepreneur, and there probably are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room since we're at Capital, <coughs> um, think about laggard industries and what you could do for them. Uh, gravel, the gravel industry. I mean, no tech person in their right mind is, is looking at the gravel industry right now, right? And, um, you know, I, for yeah, and so there, there's lots of industries that are open for disruption right now. And um, I think the, the key thing here is you were talking about fear. There's a lot of fear, um, and it's fear of the unknown because they've seen this, this tidal wave. The cloud comes in like a tidal wave into an industry and they see in, they see just change happening all across the board. So the one that, uh, that most reps that we talk to uh, bring up is uh, travel agents, where you know just uh, thousands and thousands of travel agents lost their job. Well, you know former travel agents, right? And, and they're doing something now. They're doing something probably better now because all they were was a, they were just a middleman before. And so um, they're able to make better use of their time and they're able to specialize in something and add more value. And so it's very key in our, um, as we grow as a civilization, to, um, to gracefully um, allow people uh, that, um, that, are, um, that are no longer making the right kind of stone, you know, the <laughs> and they're, they're learning something else. They're sharpening a stick or they're doing something like that and they're moving on into something else. But that fear has been with us for probably millions of years. It's totally natural. And um, over, you just look back over um, the, the arc of history and you see transparency adding quality to our lives. Our democracy would not be available to us today without the Gutenberg Press, right? And so the internet is just a real time, light speed Gutenberg Press. I absolutely agree. Did I manage to mess the microphone? I'll just pass this back to the microphone. This is a panel on technology, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
tech is really just exploded the workplace as way as we knew it uh, some some time ago. Uh, it was it was uh, so boring compared to what we see today. And really, this, you see the same model happening everywhere, and we take it for granted because it's so commonplace now. Having open spaces with lots of light, lots of opportunities for spontaneous interaction. That has become a standard model, and yet it was so un unknown just a, fa a fairly short time ago. And how, who can argue that that is an improvement in the way people spend their lives? Where would you rather be, a place like this or stuck in some dark cubicle? It is a significant improvement in the lives of the people in, in the workplace. Uh, and and then, then it's a matter of going beyond the tech workplace, taking, taking that, the, the, that kind of improvement in quality of life and introducing that kind of improvement into other realms. Uh, one of my favorites to talk about, as Chelsea mentioned, was, was transportation, which includes parking and, and, uh, and all sorts of, uh, of other things. And it's really because of tech that it's been so easy for me to give up my car. I haven't owned a car since, since 2008. Uh, and, I, and, and yet I, I feel like I, I, I'm the richest guy in the world because I've got fleets of cars. There's, there's, you've got a, a car to go everywhere you look. You've got a zip car when you need to take, take a longer trip. We've got B-cycles everywhere. There's just a whole range of options. I have, I have a, a whole array of choices before me now as a result of tech uh, when, it, when it comes to transportation. When I travel somewhere for outside of town, I have a whole array of choices in, in where I stay. It could kind of make it thanks to things like home away and Airbnb, which never would have been possible with, with, without tech. Uh, we still have, there are still uh, many unexplored horizons with all different kinds of applications where, where tech could, could offer similar improvements that we haven't even gotten into yet. Uh, and it gets down to, to uh, in, uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in residential real estate right now. I know we're supposed to be talking about commercial real estate, but, uh, uh, but uh, residential is a particular challenge here uh, in Austin because we really have, we have a real issue with uh, providing adequate housing within a reasonable distance of our central city. Uh, and that's one area where we know we're falling short, we know we could do better, but we haven't quite figured out how to get there. Uh, and I am hopeful. I don't know exactly how tech could help us solve that problem, but I suspect there are ways that we could go that, 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 that it could help. We are, we, uh, other cities have, have introduced new form-based codes to allow different house, housing options. Uh, and I suspect that as we get more educated and share information through tech about what's going on in other cities and we exercise smarter, better informed choices about where we live, that we will start to see change. I'm especially hopeful that as we get more and more uh, uh, young entrepreneurial types who are interested in new, different things, uh, that, that there will be a greater openness to seeing some changes. Right now, so much of our, of the, of our decisions related to uh, residential real estate are, are driven in large part by uh, neighborhood associations and other very established groups that are really operating in an older mode that have not, they have not really uh, uh, been that affected by all the changes that we're seeing everywhere else. And so that, that is one frontier that I, that I, where I hope we will start to continue to see changes. And there, but there are obviously others as well. There's a lot of, of uh, exciting possibilities when you think about the, uh, the potential that, that, that tech has to offer in the areas where, that we haven't really started into yet. <laughs> Maybe we'll just do this Oprah style and like start walking up and down the aisle. So, um, well, one of the um, things that happened today was kind of interesting, and uh, of course I forgot the name of the group, so I'm going to do a terrible job of thanking them. But I had a meeting today um, at this place called the Departure Lounge. Have y'all heard of it before? Yeah. Down on Fifth and Guadalupe. So it's just a perfect example, you know, going off the example of, uh, of um, uh, travel agencies where, yeah, tech comes in, completely disrupts travel agencies, and up pops this new kind of entrepreneurial idea, which is a lounge down on Fifth and Guadalupe where you can go have a cup of coffee, grab a nice drink, do whatever, uh, have a nice meeting, and oh, by the way, there's concierge service to kind of tell you and custom create a, a travel itinerary for you. So it's a custom created travel agency slash coffee shop with incredible interiors and absolute fast Wi-Fi. I mean, it's just like a dream and it never would have happened if the traditional model was in place. And the folks that I was meeting with 
um, was um, from a, a representative on the Board of Leadership Austin, which I'm a big fan of and see several of my classmates here, which is really nice, um, and a tech entrepreneur who worked for a big tech company, uh, Mutual Mobile, where there are 350 employees down on 9th and Brazos, and this was a couple of years ago, they didn't have enough options to get their workforce to and from, and then when they were in the building, what were they gonna eat, where were they gonna have lunch, what were they gonna do while we were down there? Um, so they, instead of you know, kind of saying, hey, we're gonna look to somebody else to solve this problem, they decided we're gonna solve this problem. They teamed with other um, tech companies that were a bit smaller who were having the same challenges, but on a smaller level, of course, and so now they're doing Food Truck Fridays, where a food truck will come down and serve all of that area. And um, I think they call it the Tech Corridor. Tech, am I calling it? I, I forgot the name of it, so I'm sorry for not doing my homework. Um, and they've also teamed with Capital Metro to do information sessions. And for every 10 bus passes that they hand out, they have about a 50% um, rate where people will say, yeah, we'll take the bus. We just never thought about it. or we never tried it or we were afraid or we thought the bus was stinky or whatever their kind of fear was and it's tech that's kind of enabling all of that. So I just think it's interesting kind of um, intersection of new ideas from disrupted models and entrepreneurs and tech entrepreneurs kind of taking it upon themselves to solve problems that are infrastructure issues. So. There's not really a question in there, there's just a statement. Um, so I guess the next question is, what's next? I mean, we see Austin changing. I've been here since 1994, and like you, Chris, I, I don't even recognize the town anymore. I, I can't even remember where things used to be because they've been replaced two or three times, and change is really good. It's also really tricky. It's really tricky to manage. Um, both from you know, being a resident here and from being an elected official here and a community leader. Um, and from the business community side, it's, um, you know, it takes a lot of foresight and a lot of leadership. So I think we've done an amazing job as a community of managing the incredible growth that this town is undergoing in the state for that matter. Um, but what's next? What's kind of on the horizon? What do we need as citizens um, and professionals to be aware of? So I've got good news. The future is recreation. Uh, and take that word apart and say creation, recreation. That's innovation, right? And so it's the difference between critical thinking and creative thinking. So uh, the, everybody in our office today, was uh, we had a creative day. And so some people were playing uh, games on the computer and some people were uh, outside uh, sitting on the deck in the sun. Some people were playing with the dog, but everyone was thinking. Everyone was thinking about just whatever, just whatever, right? And so people would look at, would probably look at that and go, that looks like a home. There's a dog in the office. People are playing games. Some people are listening to music. Some people are reading about the latest. Uh, if you if you hit something rhythmically enough with a hammer, it could cause a fusion reaction. That's what I was reading. <laughs> so it, what does that have to do with commercial real estate? Absolutely nothing, right? And so that's where that's where innovation comes from. That's where creative thought comes from. That's where car to go comes from. That's where every single innovation that you see comes from creative thought. Uh, uh, just seeing an opportunity and going, oh, hey, you know, remember that game we were playing the other day? What if we use the same uh, strategy in that game that, uh, on this thing over here, right? And so it's these sort of like knowledge gathering. You're, you're gathering knowledge all the time, every single day. And then you see something pop up and you go, hey, I bet I know somebody or I bet I, I have an idea where I can fix that. And the only way you get there is if you get out of manufacturing. So there's something that you do every day that you absolutely hate, probably, if you're a creative person. And you're probably pretty creative and intuitive uh, if, you're, if you're in this room right now. There's probably, all, there's probably nearly 100% um, entrepreneurial uh, personality types in this room. And there's something that you do every day that is repetitive. It's like sitting on an assembly line and going, stamp stamp, stamp, and you end up thinking about other things and you end up stamping your finger or something because it's just, you really hate doing that thing, right? Well, that is time where tech is able to come in and say, I'm gonna automate that for you. I'm gonna put that up in the cloud and you're gonna be able to recreate during that time. You're, you're gonna have recreation. 
And maybe that means sitting on a beach. Maybe that means going for a jog in this beautiful area over here. But more and more and more, that's why the creative class is being attracted to Austin, Texas. Because of the recreation that we have that's actually baked into our central business district, pretty soon, I mean, the central business district, the whole thing is gonna look like a gorgeous glass and steel and green green areas with water flowing everywhere. The uh, there's, con there's some conservancy uh, movements. Um, I don't know if you've seen the picture for the Waller Creek Conservancy movement. It, it looks like a, a still from the movie Avatar. It's lit, it's like greenery everywhere, it's, it's gorgeous. And that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. That's why I'm so interested in actually this talk with, uh, with Chris um, is um, where, where, does, where does this force, this creative class is just surging into Austin, right? And, uh, and what that does is provide more and more budget for this kind of thing to serve the voters who are this creative class. And it just, that's another hockey stick, right? Where Austin is gonna be one of the magical places to be on the planet. One in, back in the day was Milan, Italy, or, um, or uh, you know, London or Paris, and today it's going to be Austin, Texas. Well, when, when I think about the next thing on the horizon, I, I think about the biggest problems that we have because I'm hopeful that we'll figure out new ways to address them. Um, and, it, and for many people in Austin, transportation is really right at the top of the list. Transportation and affordability are, are, are really the two biggest things, but they're, of course they're intertwined because one reason affordability is a problem because you, you need to be close in because the transportation is, is so bad uh, that, that you, you, you want to minimize your, your commute. I think tech has a key role to play in, in, in both of those. On transportation, we're enabling people to make smarter choices about where they live through, through tools like WalkScore that actually help us understand exactly how dependent we'll have to be on a car when, uh, based on, on where we live. Uh, but we're also seeing other, other um, applications. I know one issue for people in this immediate area uh, is parking, and we've, we've, we've talked about that, and there are all kinds of ways that, 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 uh, that tech can, can help with that. We actually have a, a huge number of parking spaces downtown that sit empty all the time, especially especially at night, and, and it's just a matter of, of finding, identifying them and opening them up, and there, there are roles for, for, for tech to play there. We now have, uh, we, we will have a rail item on the, on the ballot this November. I'm hopeful about that passing. In the meantime, we have, uh, we are making continued improvements to our, to our transit system. Uh, as you all may know, we now have a, a have a metro rapid line, and, and part of what makes that line exciting, uh, it, that, that goes up, up uh, uh, North, uh, North Lamar and, and, and down Congress Avenue. Uh, one thing that makes that exciting is that uh, it, for the first time, uh, and it has the, the technology to allow, to let us know exactly where the buses are. I know that sounds like a very basic thing, but it took Capital Metro a while to get that in place. And so if you look at those, if you look, notice those new fancy stations for the Metro Rapid Line, you'll see the digital readout that tells you in real time when the next bus will be there. We are hopeful about getting similar technology in place uh, on, on all of our fixed route buses uh, by the end of, the end of this year. Um, it still it is very rough, and if anyone is particularly interested in that issue, please let me know because we're continuing to work with Capital Metro. I'm, I, I'm the vice group chair of, the, of Capital Metro, and I chair its operations committee, and I know we have a lot of work to do to make continued improvements with that. I'm, we, there is a great app, uh, Metro Rapid, with two Ps, that was developed independently of, of Capital Metro um, but it was based on the dat data that, that Capital Metro makes available. Uh, and it, 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 with, with the Metro Rapid app, you can, sh you can actually see where those, those Metro Rapid buses are. Uh, it's, about, it's a couple minutes behind, but it'll tell you how far behind it is. So it's not quite the <coughs> time. But that's just one, one example of how, ultimately, we ought to be able to provide better information to enable people to make well-informed choices that will make their lives a lot easier when it comes to transportation, housing, Workplace, everything else. That's what we're aiming at. We're just just getting making making those those choices available, so that people can raise their quality of lives by making by making a, a choices based on what suits them the best. Uh, and of course, that that, that uh, it's all driven by the need to, to maintain to, to stay competitive with 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 every place else uh, that that is seeking out uh, the, the the best alternatives to offer. And, 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 and those alternatives uh, are, can only be made known and available as a result of all the progress we've, we've seen with tech. 
So it's, uh, I think the future is very bright and hopeful based on, uh, based on what we've been seeing and that, that patterns what we've been saying of identifying problems and figuring out ways to address them. There's a lot more to do, but, but uh, I, I feel very confident that we're gonna keep making good progress. Transportation transparency. Just have yeah. to say that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to hear. Thank you. You're segueing into. Um, I want to hear the questions that you all have. I know we've touched on a lot of different things: uh, real estate, technology, land use, uh, work styles, uh, everything in between. So, gentlemen in the blue shirt, and um, please say your name and who you were with and okay. your question. Thank sure. you. My name is Rick Zeman. A company Smart Patent, I help people with new ideas. And so I, my question is for Josh. Before I answer, ask my question of Josh, I want to ask Chris to think about it. When, I, it, it. when I experienced Austin, and I came here in 93, as a year before you, and three years after you, um, I feel like the city council in particular and the a consortium of the people who do the the, uh, the parking and the people who do the construction are conspiring to make parking impossible in this town <laughs> and profoundly horrible. It doesn't have to be. So I want you to really think about that as a person who doesn't live in the city, who does have a car. You, you, you're, you're insulting us and you're disrespecting us. And I understand that it's an issue, but it doesn't have to be as horrible as it is. For example, when a new construction happens, and there's a lot of them, and they build these walkways with the covered thing, why don't they raise them up and put parking there instead of ruining the parking there? Because, I, I mean, it feels like it's 50% of all the parking. So I, I really want you to think about the people who don't live in the city, who don't want to continue, you know, I came here in the 90s, I want to come into the city and enjoy it, and I can't, I don't, I stop. I'm profoundly frustrated. And it feels um, it feels like I'm being disrespected and being told we don't want you here. We only work Can I answer that? People. So it sounds like you're in pain, and I like solving yeah, pain. Yeah. So, <laughs> I have a more direct question for you, which is: I think you know something about commercial real estate, which has a. I mean, you started off by this pain idea, and I and I know someone who needs commercial real estate here in the next two months. Maybe three. And I'm hoping I can find the right person whose family knows where the special piece is because it's so broken. Are they looking in the central business di district he wants downtown? To go to Sixth Street because yeah. he's a so cool Sixth Street. Parking is that. absolutely ridiculous downtown. And um, you said I know something about commercial real estate. I actually know very, very little about okay. commercial real estate. Um, my experience is in marketing commercial real estate, which is a totally different thing, right? Uh, so uh, there's a lot of uh, real estate people in the room. I, I recognize some of them. They know a lot more about it. And really what, what that is is about relationships. And then what they're, they're forced to do, remember the stamp thing I was telling you, I was talking about? They, they are forced to go into this data manufacturing role of basically getting, not basically, literally getting out a spreadsheet and trying to figure out what the parking ratio is for every single building in town, right? And they're all have, they all have their own individual spreadsheets that they're all calling every single building in town, right? And so imagine being the building owner, right? And so if every single person who needs that information is having to call you for the parking ratio for your building, it's like you have to you have to maintain the relationship, but it's a little frustrating. It's like it's not a recreation thing. It's like I just I answered the same thing four times today, right? And so I'm getting a little uh, I don't want to answer the phone. And so when the young entrepreneur who needs two thousand square feet calls you, you say get lost, pal, or you don't even take the call that's coming in from your receptionist. And so uh, the the key thing here, and it goes to your question to the councilman as well, is transparency. Because um, when, when you add that walkway, now you're making more of this creative class come to town, right? We've got 110 people coming to Austin every single day, right? And so uh, one day's worth of people will fill up your walkway parking spots, right? And so that's not an answer to get rid of the walkways or put, uh, just try to put parking spots underneath there. There needs to be a lot more transparency. There's so many parking spots in town. Uh, Craig and I get so frustrated for, uh, about that. We're looking a rapidly growing co uh, company. Uh, we've gone from uh, Craig and me 
to um, I will have uh, about 40 people uh, by the end of the year. So imagine like the, the minimum term uh, for a lease for an office is a three year term, right? And so what are we supposed to do? We sign a three year term for two people and then by the end of the, by 12 months from now with 40 people, it's impossible, right? And so it's, there's no way to get an office in that situation. And so it's, um, it's, it's incredibly frustrating uh, in a town that fosters entrepreneurialism to say you need to sign a three year lease, right? And so there's a lot of things that need to change. The key thing is transparency. If you, um, have you heard of uh, efficient market theory? There's a Nobel Prize for it uh, quite a while ago, in the 1940s is when it was invented, and all portfolios today in the stock market are managed with efficient market theory now. And that's what's happening right now, is we need, a, we need an information marketplace, an information marketplace like the internet, uh, like, uh, like HomeAway. HomeAway provides a, a marketplace as well for, uh, for that sort of thing. So um, office space needs the same sort of thing. The problem with office space is that, uh, is that you have so many places, so many venues for the data, that what happens is the person who's responsible for updating all of those, they, they just get into manufacturing overload, right? It's like I updated the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the governor's uh, office, the mayor's office, um, uh, I've answered um, five phone calls today from people calling in to me, and uh, I just realized that um, four of the 200 PDFs that I just sent out to everybody um, are totally wrong. And so I know that over, I'm gonna update them again in a month, I'm gonna update the governor's office in a month. So over 30 days now, on those four spots, I'm gonna be getting erroneous phone calls all the time now, right? So just like, oh, I gotta get the PDF. Well, am I gonna go update everybody again? No, I don't have time because they need me to do this, exactly. right? Completely inefficient, right? And so um, the, the key, long story short, is transparency. For your problem and for the question that you asked me is, is we need to get uh, transparent to ask. The best thing that's out there now, other than trying to find a person who knows it. Um, Real Massive is the best thing that's about to be out there. But there's, there's nothing uh, available right now. What is it? I don't know what it is. Uh, Real Massive is a uh, it's an online uh, marketplace. We say it's commercial real estate in real time. And so basically what we do is um, we ask those overtasked marketing managers who are updating everybody to update us once. We syndicate it out to everybody, include, including Google. We uh, put it out everywhere. Google wants floor plans for every building right now. You probably heard about that, right? And so our marketing managers are uploading floor plans to everybody, governor's office, et cetera, right? So they put it in our system. We syndicate it out to Google. We syndicate all this availability information out to Google, LinkedIn, governor's office, mayors, every, all of those. Everybody's on board with that. Everybody wants the data, right? So in order, to, uh, in order to have that kind of business model, you have to do it for free. That's why it hasn't been done before. Because now everybody in the world has the data that we work so hard to get, right? So we're, we're spending a lot of money curating data, making sure it's accurate, and then syndicating it out to everyone. And so the only way that you make money in a situation like that is by creating value. You have to, um, anybody use Evernote? There's probably lots of Evernote users in the room, right? So Evernote, how much did you pay when you downloaded Evernote? And yet it's one of the most useful apps that you have on your phone or on your computer, right? And it's free. So um, um, what we're trying to do is actually use that freemium model, add a lot of value to the process, and then start predicting where the parking is for you. And so um, as a professional, and you're trying to market a building, or you're trying to f help somebody find buildings, and they're signing a five-year, a seven-year lease, you need to tell them where the parking's gonna morph to, not just where the parking is at right now, right? And so that's what we're trying to do, is get ahead of the data, to go beyond the data into the future, get rid of the quarterly reports that everyone is using right now, which means you're looking 90 days in the past to figure out where your office should be three years from now. Um, it's really kind of silly. So we're trying to get ahead of that and predict, and then allow people to collaborate as well. So. Um, yeah, so um, collaboration basically, listening to the conversation, the conversation we're having right now, there's a lot of truth in that conversation. And so that educates our, uh, basically our com computation engine in the background is the conversation that's going back and forth with the collaboration. 
Kathleen, just to follow up on that, you know, from a policy perspective, um, we get really excited about that because there's a part for everyone to play. There's a part for the angry consumer and resident to play. You know, I have pain, my needs aren't getting met, the beautiful city that I used to visit, I can no longer do it. I have a solution, who else has solutions? And in, in um, the old way of doing it, then we would look to elected officials or government or said person in charge to hey, fix my problem. When now we can welcome the market to help us fix their problem, fix that problem in cooperation with elected officials. So it's not just a market problem. It's not just an elected official problem. It's not just a citizen's problem. It's everyone working together. And it starts with the pain, and then it's a unique solution enabled by technology. And that's what I get really excited about is the the potential for all of that for a real positive result. Did you want to add something? Sure. I just I totally get that, that parking it could be a pain. I just I would like to know some of the progress that, that we've made. It wasn't that long ago that we actually were, had still had those old coin, coin operated meters downtown. We actually had a ton of complaints from those coin operators because often they just didn't work. People get tickets when they didn't work. It was a real problem. So then we, Austin was one of the first cities that got out there and moved to those kiosks, which there is some significance to that because now well, the, the, the basic problem that we have is making better information available to the consumer. So if you knew where you could find parking and you were able to get to it easily, that would, that would solve the problem. And so we have been working aggressively to make that information easily accessible for you. So now there are apps like Park Me, our best parking, which will tell you in real time what parking is available nearby and how much it will cost. Even, it even goes right down to the parking on the street. On Best Parking, you can see in real time uh, what, what, what street parking is available. They will use, use uh, red or green to tell you where, where you're likely to find it. And that is based on real time data coming from those kiosks that you see there on the street. That's still not enough. Uh, street parking is never going to be enough to meet the demand. We, we need to make uh, the, the inventory of uh, structured parking available, as well as just off-street surface parking. Uh, and we've been work act actively working on, on getting together with the owners of, of downtown parking garages, um, and that's why you see so many options on those apps, that that inf information is available as a result of the collaboration that the city has promoted by working with the owners of those parking garages. We're also trying to get smarter about the city's own facilities, and this is one where we've still got a long way to go. The city actually still has a lot of parking that just gets closed up at, at, at the end of the workday, sealed off. You can see this at, at Waller Creek Center, 625 East 10th Street, right there by the Red River Entertainment District. Every night, the, the, the gates come down. Great big parking garage just sitting completely gated off. That is a huge public resource that we're just gating off and not making available. So we are working actively with, with the city staff to change that, to, to identify that as a resource and, and getting and changing the way we approach that, to make that available. Uh, and that is, we, we need to keep at it. I'm, I'm, I'm with you that, that it is a problem that needs to be solved, but I think we are pointing in the right direction and I'm hopeful about making further progress. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Byers. I'm born and raised in Austin. I do commercial real estate at Sayers and Associates. My question is for either or both of you, uh, and it's kind of tangentially related to what we've been talking about. My question is about public safety. Um, and in the last six weeks, there have been nine pedestrians killed in downtown Austin. Um, and I'm wondering what role uh, you think uh, real estate or tech or uh, just as you know, the council member in uh, what's going to be District 9 and someone that works downtown, what can you guys do and what can we do to, to combat this problem? I think this is not a flippant answer um, or aside, but my personal opinion is I think we have a lot of Californians here in Texas where California pedestrians have the right of way. And I'm, I swear, I'm not trying to be funny about it, but in California, you know, I stand on the, on the street corner because I think the car is going to run right by and in Texas cars have the right of way so part of it is an education um, kind of initiative but no that's not the full answer self-driving cars it's going to happen and you're going to see the uh, the safety rate go way up and depending on where you uh, how you value freedom I value freedom very highly um, you know there's a debate to be had there on do you want to give up your freedom for the convenience of no traffic jams and you don't have to worry about your daughter getting hit by a car or by a drunk driver, right? And so um, I think you know the more transparency you get into a civilization, a society, the uh, the less privacy you have, 
and the less freedom you have. And so you're giving up individual rights for the common good, uh, which um, I think as we, uh, as our population density increases, and the more uh, silly Californians you get in Austin, Texas, uh, the more the more you need self-driving cars. <laughs> I love California, by the way. Um, so. It's a great question because it is a huge problem and a lot of people are talking about it right now. But, uh, just a few things that, that, that we are working on to, to, to address it. Uh, first, we've heard uh, that there is an interest in having overnight parking options available. Uh, there are some available, but they're hard to find. We're, we're working on, on getting uh, information about that out there, having it in, uh, in a place that's easy to find on the city's website, and working with uh, the Commission of Visitors Bureau and others to, 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 to promote information about that. Uh, late night transit options. We, we already run the train late at night on Fridays and Saturdays. We also have the, 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 uh, uh, the night owl service for, for Cap Metro, and we're working to see what we can do to step up those options. We actually have expanded that service in, uh, recently, but I think we could, we could look at doing more. Uh, we also need to do better at providing taxi cab service uh, and other, um, other, other ground transportation for hire. Uh, we are approaching the renewal of our taxi cab franchises in August of twenty of next year, and so we and so we have we have a we have a stakeholder working group uh, that that is working on how on expectations for that process. It, it is a it is a complicated problem, and it does raise something. Actually, you mentioned Uber. It's funny. That's another thing we can learn from California. California is the one jurisdiction in the country that has has actually figured out an approach to managing transportation networking companies. That's, that's what, they, for a while we were calling ride sharing, which was, wasn't really a very good name, transportation networking companies. That's what they're calling companies like Uber and Lyft and, and Sidecar, uh, things like that are, are TNCs now, transportation networking companies. It's a complicated thing because uh, you have, we do have a, a whole set of regulations that are built up around taxi cabs, but really for the protection of the consumer. And we need to think carefully about what regulations we're gonna have in place to protect the consumer when it comes to TNCs. And you wanna have a fair playing field uh, as between those, those two options. We are sorting through that now. There is a subcommittee of the Urban Transportation Commission that has been working on, on, on an approach, regulatory approach for TNCs. Hasn't been getting very far, so I think we're going to try and uh, uh, step up our efforts on that. If you are interested in being a stakeholder in that process, let me know because we're get, we're going to get something going on that because TNCs have a lot to offer, and that may be one important part of the solution to meeting that peak demand problem. It is, it is just real briefly part of the problem is just just dumping more taxi cab permits out on the street doesn't really fix the problem. Taxi cabs under the current model are independent contractors. They actually we actually have a reduction in the number of drivers choosing to drive in late night hours. Even though the permits are there, the cabs are available, drivers are choosing not to drive in the late night hours because they don't want to be, they, they don't want to be, put up with that? they don't, I'm sorry? Why would you want to put up with that? Why would you want to, it's a bunch of drunk kids. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we tried, we, we actually, uh, uh, we actually uh, allowed a, a dollar surcharge for late night trips and we also imposed a, a $100 cleanup fee. Now if somebody throws up in a cab, <laughs> there's a hundred dollar cleanup fee and, and that the idea was to try to make it uh, uh, more appealing to drivers to, to, to those late night routes it still hasn't worked we really need to rethink the model the problem is that that peak demand periods both at late night friday and saturday nights and at times like south by and acl meeting that demand with taxi cabs is not is no easy thing because that you can't just flood the market with permits because that creates issues for the drivers but for them to non-peak times I think there may be ways that TNCs could help us solve that peak demand problem. And that's why it's really important to figure that out now as we approach the renewal of, of those cab franchises. And so I'm hopeful about seeing some progress on that soon. Glenn, just one quick plug for public policy. Um, you know, I'm really um, encouraged to hear this level of conversation. Um, and I didn't plan it, I promise, but it turned out exactly the way I wanted it to. Um, because, you know, you look at something like TNCs and cabs and, you know, as residents, we all feel that pain. And to your point, um, Chris, it's just never that simple. And it's the conversation between the private market and elected officials around regulations and around policy that on the surface, it seems really, really simple. But then you dial back and you look at just a simple challenge, which is cabs don't want to deal with drunk 20-somethings. Um, then how do we solve that problem? And there's a role for everyone to play. So 
um, my big takeaway from events like this, you know, my job is to put people in a room that don't normally um, talk to each other. And so that's just something to think about um, as we leave, but we don't have to leave yet. Oscar, you had a question. Uh, Oscar, good life, Realty. Uh, are there any other models in any other cities uh, using technology to contribute to urban planning and walkability scores that you see coming to Austin? And I want to do one quick, sorry, one quick plug um, for Good Life Team. Oscar has been a good friend for a long time, and Good Life Team CEO Christina Wise is on our board, and she's on our board for a very specific reason. Uh, she's been a real leader in technology and residential real estate. They were awarded two years ago, is that right? The Inman Award uh, for technology and for innovation, excuse me. Um, and I think it's really fantastic that on a national scale, a local boutique uh, real estate company is, is being awarded that way and recognized that way. So thanks for all of your work, Oscar. Now, back to the question. So in, in this case, it's not a matter of, uh, I always say transparency, it seems like, right? It's not really a matter of transparency, it's really a matter of uh, data aggregation. Uh, so um, to repeat your question, um, what are what are what technologies could possibly uh, you know, solve some of the city planning issues that we have? Well, um, there's there's a lot of companies out there. Prudential, CoStar, um, CBRE, JLL. They all produce uh, quarterly and annual reports based on how many um, population vectors, where the uh, where people are going. I'm sure the councilman is, is, is on those all the time. And the problem is um, if you have four reports, four reports say four different things, right? And so um, really this is, a, this is an area where uh, tech can come in with quantitative results. And so both Apple and Google are tracking where you're at all the time. You've probably read articles about that, right? And so, uh, so they know where everybody's at. They see the 110 people coming in per day. They see where your commute is every single day, and uh, and what um, what will happen is that and, and that um, that data is actually pretty freely available. So you can right now you could open up your phone and you could look at a live traffic report before you head out the door, right? And you're going to be able to see where the red lanes are versus where the green lanes are. And so um, imagine that for um, where people are moving, um, for instance, like um, if there was a heat map of downtown, you would see that all the businesses are trying as hard as they possibly can, especially the tech businesses and the creative uh, class businesses are all trying to get to the central business district, right? Which is, which is aggravating the, uh, the parking problem. And so what's happening is because there's, um, there's no parking downtown, so you've got you know, Facebook, and Google's moving downtown. Um, you've got Dropbox that's moving downtown, right? And these are these are large companies with multiple floors of buildings. So where are they parking? They're not. They're not parking. So what's happening is you're seeing a lot of uh, apartment complexes going up all over the place, right? These are basically tech dorms, dormitories, and so you're you're uh, you're getting this creative class that both both live and work downtown. And so it's changing, it's changing the landscape of the city. It's solving this parking problem that's such a, a big pain, right? But it takes time to do that, and it takes uh, billions of dollars to do it. And you've got to convince the, the multi-billion dollar publicly traded REITs out there to invest in Austin and build those apartment complexes, build what you need in your, in your town, not just what they think was needed 90 days ago in one of the quarterly reports, right? And so the data's there, we need to aggregate it, and then we need to syndicate it out to all of these Wall Street firms um, all over the world, make that very freely available, have a trusted marketplace for that information, and you'll see cities blossom all over the country. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I am very optimistic about getting more product on the ground to meet the demands that we have. I, I think your question was really about planning, and I don't, I don't know of any planning firms that are planning on coming here. I know that we do have talent, plan, planning, plan, planning talent visiting Austin fairly often and helping us solve problems, and we are developing tools like a, an Envision Tomorrow tool that we got we developed through a sustainability grant from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. But, but, but in terms of actual firms coming in, I, I don't know. But, but um, as Josh was saying, we do have uh, new products, new types of products being coming, uh, materializing all the time. I, this week I met with 
uh, a guy who's uh, at, at well, well, it was last week, a developer out of Seattle who's doing micro units, and he uh, he actually just did a tour of something like 21 cities across the across the country, trying to identify places that would be good for micro units, units of 500 square feet or less. He says that the A list is Austin, Denver, and Boulder. He said there really is no B list. <laughs> There's a great big C list, but but really those are the three targets because they keep, they realize what an appetite there is for that sort of thing. We have uh, currently with the with the units that we have coming on downtown, we are as Josh indicated, we we are seeing different interests. We we actually have at the, at the Whitley over on Third Street, uh, their new place opened up. They're they're like most of the now, new new downtown places and in West Campus. Parking is an add-on. It is an option. It, it, unlike the conventional model, it does not come automatically as part of your unit. You get you pay one price per unit, and if you want any parking spaces, an extra, it is an extra price. What they're finding is that so far about 20% of those taking the efficiencies in one bedrooms are opting not to take a parking space at all. And I think we're, that that is only going to go up from there. You're going to see more and more people just choosing not to bring their cars. And I know. Many, many of us say, well, that's, sure, that's them, but what does that do for me? But it does actually help all of us, because if we had more of that growth going to people who are not bringing their cars with them, that makes that, that blunts the impact of that growth. So at least we're at 20% now, but if, you, if, that, if, if that keeps growing, that means that's a, that's a positive thing for all of us, whether we drive or not, both in terms of parking and congestion and everything else. So again, I think we're headed in a good direction. Um, it's not so much a question as a follow-up comment. I don't think it's so much that um, money needs convincing to be here. I think it's more the neighborhood groups and certain city policies making enabling the money to be spent here. Because right now there's a lot of uncertainty around development, and so it makes it very hard to put up the money to develop a high-rise because there's added costs, added time, and a lot of uncertainty. I think that's where we need to start, not so much convincing Wall Street. Good point. So what can we do to facilitate more conversation between private sector and government? That's my follow-up question. <laughs> Encourage the tech sector to vote. Amen. And Great and answer. And to participate in our neighborhood. Yeah. Exactly. Well, cool. Vote. Yeah. 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 Great. Other questions? I got a basic question. Yes, sir. Robert Howden, chairman of TVP, I worked with Chelsea. Um, in my career in government affairs and sales and marketing, I find more and more of the people I deal with and clients work out of their homes, especially if they travel quite a bit. Have you all seen a reduction in office space because of people that come to and stay at home? So uh, one of the marketing meetings that I, that I was just in, um, we came up with a with sort of a slogan for where the future is going, and uh, it's really your new office is in the cloud. And by that, I mean uh, more and more people are working from their homes, or working from the beach, or working from the airplane because there's Wi-Fi on your flight now. And so, what is the difference between where you live and where you work? It's really starting to uh, it's starting to um, blur. The line is definitely blurring, right? And there's a, there's a little bit of a, I work everywhere now complaint, but then there's also there's also going to be very soon. I know it's at our company. It's this way. It's we play everywhere now, and so if, if you're working everywhere and you want to have that recreate, you want to have that creative experience, then do something. That allow, do something for a living that makes you really joyful, right? Because then you're going to be just joyful all the time. And so um, I think the that blurring of the line uh, is kind of what you're where, what you're talking about. I, I think uh, I think because the cloud follows us everywhere, we'll never really be disconnected from what we do as an occupation. And that also means that we're not going to be disconnected from what we do. Uh, uh, for instance, um, from my from my children or uh, or from my family, et cetera, I'm able to be in touch with them a lot more. And so, really, what that fosters is is tighter relationships. It's it's really you have now you have time for relationships because you don't have to travel so much to get there. You're able to spend more time. I spend all the time with my dog now. I have a great relationship with my dog. She follows me everywhere. So it's like uh, I think uh, I think relationships are the key to almost every business endeavor. And, uh, and tech really fosters that. Uh, TEP is really fostering that right here. Um, and, uh, and Texas and Austin in particular are really good about public-private partnership. The 
the only thing I add to that is that, that yes, that there have been real changes. So we had more people per floor plate in the building, it, uh, per, per every building. That's part of what's driven to make parking such a problem. It's because when, when a building, when a commercial office buildings that we have originally went up, it, we, they were based on the conventional model that, had, that actually involved a lot more square footage per person. And now with this, with this new model, one aspect of that new model is that so many more people in areas like this, different sort of workplace, it does involve a much greater density of people, of people per floor. And that's one of the things that has driven the shortage of parking. Well, and just one example of this, and Robert, you may or may not know this, but Last year, um, I went on a 10-day road trip from Texas up to uh, New York State, and I had a mobile hotspot with me the entire time. So, of course, I wasn't driving, I was in the passenger seat, but I was doing Skype calls, I was completely connected, I didn't miss a day. So, it's really interesting to me how that connectivity is going to fuel an entire new way of working that you know, of course, has implications on how offices are built and where people park and where they live and how they work and when they work and their relationships with their uh, families, significant others, dogs, um, but also on just basic HR policies. I mean, what is a vacation day? What is a work from home versus work from the office? What's the difference? And who cares if I'm, you know, in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains with a great Wi-Fi signal or I'm in a capital building in Austin, Texas. It doesn't really matter as long as the work gets done. So I think entrepreneurs and tech companies really embrace that and support it. Um, I know plenty of more traditional businesses who aren't quite so supportive and they're still, you know, seats and seats kind of mentality. So it'll it'll be interesting to see how that morphs. So any other questions? All right, we'll do closing thoughts. Um, I'll do the final closing thoughts. So Josh, I'll let you, if you have any other thoughts, comments, questions, <coughs> call to actions. I feel like I've talked a lot. So if you have any one-on-one uh, -on -one questions, I'll be around for as long as you need. I'll stand here and I would put out a plea to you that if you see a way that that, uh, that government can work better with you, please let me know. And, it, and, it's, it, and I, I really mean that because so much of what I think why I'm hopeful is not because the government's going to apply, going to develop technology that's going to make things better. It's because we have a tech sector that's going to going to help us get to those right solutions. And I know that depends on the, on on us making sure that the right data is available, and then y'all making good use of it. And and so please, if you're interested in that, uh, in working with me on that, then, then please uh, let me know, and I, I, I'd be glad to hear. From you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for your great questions. Thanks for in advance for the questions that you will have. I hope this conversation has inspired some thought about um, you know, the challenges that we all see, how the solutions are being created, and how you can create part of that solution, too. And my challenge to you to leave behind um, is just to go ahead and really get involved. Um, check out these websites. Check out, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to all of our newsletters, get involved in the conversation, um, regulatory issues and policy. It's just not as simple as it seems on the surface, um, but with all of us working together and all having a voice, then we're gonna get there and there is a good place. So thanks, let's visit and drink beer.